once again back is the incredible <laughs> okay all right everybody just calm down we're here for part three of the card allotment and as you recall we were about to approach the dwarves but be careful and be quiet because they might be sleeping let's go take a look <laughs> okay the dwarves of osiah lux to distinguish them from other dwarves, although Asaya Lux is the main home of the dwarves. They're island dwellers. Um, Osaya Lux, also known as Light World on the Water. Um, there's an elaborate uh, story that goes into that. I guess we shouldn't spend too much time on it, but basically um, the dwarves are sea miners who um, mine this substance called lumen from beneath the ocean, which creates light. Uh, obviously, we're in an age where there's no electricity, um, so it's either flame or it's lumen, which is um, exclusively mined by the dwarves, which has made them very, very rich. And Osaya Lux is a, uh, an amazing city to behold, unlike anything else um, in Redemir. Um, its island uh, location has also, um, you know, sort of protected it from, from attack. And the dwarves are... Um, deeply involved in magic, alchemy, and also martial combat. So they're very, very capable. They're lore masters. Um, they pretty much represent the premier culture of Renamir. Um, so there's kind of a, a, a complex political um, arrangement that leads to the dwarves actually getting involved in this um, this conflict in Canton Fields, because Canton Fields is a somewhat rustic area. There's not much there of interest for the dwarves, but um, many of the men and elves of the, um, the uh, northern mage academies in Dawn are from, originally from Canton Fields. So um, they have an interest in protecting it, um, as well as, you know, keeping the orcs at bay. We don't want them coming, you know, right next door. And so the dwarves kind of send a, a, a token reinforcement initially. And uh, this proves to be insufficient in the long run. Um, okay, so let's see. As for the, 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 dwarf, uh, the dwarven reinforcements, they're going to have a high defense. Um, they're going to have many evade abilities, which we haven't spoken about just yet. And unit defense is typically higher than cost. Okay, so it's going to be harder to capture them than it's going to be to recruit them. Um, they're fairly ready recruits um, because they were sent here for that purpose. But um, again, within the context of the deck building game, you know, mechanically speaking, we do have to pay a cost to recruit them. We don't just get them all for free. Um, and, and their defense is going to be higher than their cost. Okay, so uh, as for equipment, smelling salts. This is an equipment card that does not need to be attached. You see here we have attachments. Attachment cards are going to be the cards that make use of that proficiency on units that we spoke about in the last video. Um, equipment that does not need to be attached is just a card that you play from your hand. Cost one. Mm, I did want to get in some cards that were a very, very low cost. Um, it's also defense one. Sometimes you have that kind of one left over when you're playing a deck building game, and it's nice to have cards that you can grab for one or destroy for one if you're the opponent. Destroy this card to return a unit from your discard pile to your hand. A great ability, but it's one-time use. You're going to destroy this card, and that's why it's so cheap. You're going to pay for something that you're going to later lose. But you're going to lose it, um, hopefully, to get a unit at a, at a pivotal point where you really need it to kind of put you over that... Um, that cap for taking out a captain or uh, or buying something that you want from the active field, you know, maybe taking a, a dead hand and turning it into uh, a purchase, something like that. VP zero, okay, so it's not going to be worth any VP. This is something that you're buying temporary use. It's like, you know, buying a Snickers bar. There's not going to be any long-term benefit to this. Um, Although a Snickers bar, I suppose, could help you survive in a very desperate situation. But even that would be a short-term benefit. You'd need another Snickers bar after a day or so. So, yeah, smelling salts. Very straightforward. Uh, we don't have any attachments so far for the dwarves. Um, so we're going to move right into the tactics. Defense drills. Uh, this is a tactics card that you're going to play. Um, which means it just plays right from your hand. Um, 
the cost is five cunning, the defense is six cunning, because it's defense drills, so its defense is going to be bumped up just a little bit. It's a permanent card, though, so when you play it, it's going to stay out. When attacked, you may switch an evade card in your hand with one in your discard pile. Okay, so evade cards. Um, uh, an evade card allows you to evade an attack made against you. Um, there's different kinds of evade cards in the game, as we're going to see next down here, because there's different types of attacks in the game. So, if, um, if we're down here with the bandits and we see that they're making a sabotage attack, you would need a, a sabotage evade in order to evade it. Another kind of evade wouldn't do the trick. So, um, the defense drills allows you to, you know, get the right defense card into your hand. So when you're attacked, you can take an evade card that's inappropriate, and you can um, switch it with one in your discard pile that, that would serve the purpose. Okay, and this is Drillmaster Hawkbeak, who, uh, who's making the call here for the defensive drills. Okay, and he'll, he's going to come up a little bit later. All right, so let's go to the Bandits of Dun uh, Doonesboro and take a look at this sabotage attack. Choose an opponent to reveal their hand. Choose one equipment card to be discarded. Okay, so this is sabotage. We're going we're gonna to sabotage their equipment in this case. It costs four cunning. Um, the Bandits also will give you one combat or two cunning. Remember, Doonesboro is like a land of scavengers, outcasts, scoundrels. Um... They're less capable in fighting than they are in trickery and that sort of thing. So their cunning is a little bit higher than their combat, even though they're dwarves. Um, and actually, this card should not be here. Because these bandits of Doonesboro are not dwarves of Osiolux. So this card actually needs to be moved to the, um, moved to the uh, faction cards. This would be a faction unit. So we're going to drop this in here. Uh, what was it? B for bandit, right? So we're going to drop it in right here. Okay. Okay. Um, let's return to our dwarves. And see who's next. Um, although, actually, I mean, we didn't completely look at these guys. Um, uh, bu 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 yeah, their, f their cunning and their combat are the same, because even though they're dwarves, which are, d you know, um, defense, defensive units, um, these bandits, again, are like kind of scoundrels, they're not dwarves proper, who would be armored up, and this and that, but they can be used to fortify, um, should you have the need, and they do have the melee and ranged uh, proficiency, so they're a little bit versatile, as, you know, tricksters often are, they have to do what they have to do to get by, they have a kind of variety of skills and whatnot, and they're only worth uh, one victory point. Okay, good. So let's take a look now at who's next. The Detonation Divisor. Uh, seven Cunning. So this, this card has a pretty high cost, and as you can see, has two victory points as opposed to the usual one. It doesn't offer combat, it does offer Cunning, because it's a divisor, okay, this is somebody who um, plants bombs, you know, figures out where to put them, how to make them, so cunning is going to be high, combat really isn't their focus. They have six um, defense, so it's actually lower than cunning. We said the dwarves usually have a higher defense than cost, I'm sorry, cost, not cunning. Um, but in this case, the detonation divisor is not a warrior, okay, so um, more of a, a, a mental unit, so to speak. But it can be used to fortify, and you would probably want to do that. Um, let's take a look at its ability. Choose a unit in the opponent's row of the active field. Destroy that unit and any units adjacent to it. Okay, so... Alright, so yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. This might not be um, the preferred card to fortify, but it is giving you too cunning. Now, there's something that I need to mention in terms of assault, just so you can kind of um, have a frame of reference for, for, for these numbers and what their value is. When you make an assault, you're going to play cards from your hand. That's going to also include cards from your reserves when you're making an assault. For the defender, it's going to include reserves, hand, and fortifying units. And what you're going to be doing is playing them from your hand one at a time. Any assault abilities are going to re resolve immediately when you play the card. Uh, you could think of something like Rune Age. Um, and you're going to be trying to match a number of combat and a number of cunning. 
So if you have cards equaling seven combat, then you're going to want to have seven or more cunning because only the matched amounts are going to count toward your assault total and the assault total of the attacker and defender are going to be compared when the assault is over um, and the one with the higher total is going to win. Okay, so you have to match combat and cunning. An assault is not just a rah, rush in and kill everybody. It takes some strategy. You have to be able to plan on the battlefield. You know, any, any war buff knows that, that war is uh, equally combat and cunning, if not more cunning than combat often. Okay, hopefully, because it results in less casualties usually. But, um, so you're going to want to match combat and cunning. So the detonation divisor might be useful in an assault because it does provide two cunning, which... Again, you know, you might have a tendency having more cunning cards in your hand to start the game because you have seven guile and only um, three might, at least right now. Those numbers are subject to change, we'll see. You might have a tendency to be like, oh, I gotta go buy combat cards. Kind of like when you're playing Marvel, Mar Marvel Legendary, a lot of times you'll take recruit cards when you can get them, but you're really trying to get those attack cards, you know? Um, but here you're gonna wanna make sure that you're balanced throughout because when you're making assaults, you're gonna need both of these. Okay, so now, any abilities like this are not going to come into play during assaults. Only assault abilities are going to come into play. And this card doesn't have an assault ability. But it is going to contribute to two cunning. It is going to um, provide these proficiencies, which may be important. And, of course, two VP, the detonation divisor. And now here's Drillmaster Hawkbeak. We were just talking about you. Here he is. Seven cunning, two combat. I'm sorry, um, that's the cost, seven cunning. Two combat and four cunning is what he provides, okay? So that's excellent. I mean, four cunning is, is that the highest we've seen so far? I think so. And uh, nine defense. The drill master is, you know, the guy who was on the defensive drills card. So he's, he's going to have a high defense. He knows what he's doing out there. And he's also able to fortify. He'd be somebody you'd probably want to use for fortification because he's got both. And he also has a high cunning, which is probably going to be a little bit harder to come by at that point. So um, so his versatility also makes him very useful, um, because if you need to get a little bit more combat or a little bit more cunning, you can play him in either direction. Um, and let's take a look at his ability. You may place an evade card in your hand or discard pile on top of your deck. So if you've played the, um, the uh, Cerberus Engine deck building games like DC, um, you're familiar with attack and defense. And when you get that defense card into your hand, it's, um, you know, during your turn, it's not as useful because um, you only get attacked on the opponent's turn. So it's the same thing here. You get attacked on your opponent's turn and you want to have that defense card in your hand during their turn. But during your turn, you know, a defense card is not really all that useful unless it has other abilities that, that come into play. All right, so now this allows you to take one of those evade cards, which is in effect a defense card, um, and put it on top of your deck for your next hand. So if you didn't get attacked and you didn't use your evade card, now you can take that card and put it on top of your deck and have another shot at it the next turn. So that's going to make you much more defensive because in effect you have two turns where this evade card was providing protection. Okay. Now remember, in this game, the evade card is less powerful than, than the defense card. It's only one-third as effective because there's three attack types and three evade types, and you have to line them up to have um, a successful defense. Um, so having uh, an increased opportunity to use that card becomes all the more important, you see. Okay. Um, recruits quickly learn to avoid drawing the drill master's attention but none dare to ignore his call. Okay, so he's tough, stern drill master, and we're familiar with the, uh, with the type. Okay, and seven cost, two VP. Now, just as I'm pr making these preliminary uh, values, what I've come up with is kind of a system of figuring out how much VP a card should have based on these numbers. So, um, you know, he's got, we're gonna take the higher of these two values, which is four, and we're going we're gonna to determine the cost now. We're going to determine the cost, which is going to help us determine the VP. Basically, costs of seven or more are getting uh, two VP, you know, and then maybe if it was up even higher, if the cost was maybe like, you know, I don't know, 11 or more, it might be three or something like that, but it all depends on the abilities and how valuable the card is. But since the cost is going to determine the VP, what's going to determine the cost? The cost is going to be, um, here you see, we're going to take the higher of the two because you can only use one at a time, so four, so that's going to be a base cost of four. 
Um, and then we're going to add one for uh, an ability, which would be five. And then we're going to take other things into consideration. For instance, his increased uh, defense relative to his cost. So maybe he gets a point for that. That's six. And then he has both of these in significant values. So that gives him some added versatility. So we're going to maybe throw him a point for that. Then we get it seven. You see? So it's a loose system, but it gives us some kind of a guideline on how to price these cards. Um, you know, you, you, at this point, again, everything's up in the air because we haven't tested the game. So we have to come up with some way to lay these numbers out. And then when we play it, we see how it plays out. Where we're saying, man, these cards are too expensive. I got a lot of dead hands. I can't buy anything. Or this is getting ridiculous. I'm, I'm getting like three cards every turn. It's, the game's moving too quickly. Um, you know, and this is stuff that all has to be balanced later on. But right now, that's kind of how we're figuring it out. We're starting with the higher of the common cunning as the base cost and then we're adding on a point for an ability unless it's some kind of really awesome ability maybe you'd get two but we're adding on a point for that and then you know other considerations you know maybe if you had all three proficiencies you might give them one for that it's you know right now it's all kind of nebulous but that's basically how i'm coming up with the cost and then the vp um i think i've been going with seven so if it's seven or more cost he's going to get you know you know set between seven and like ten he's going to get two vp i believe that's what i've been doing let's see as we go Okay, the Guardian of the Frontline. Four cost. Gets one and one on the common cunning. But the defense is six. Okay, so very high defense because he's a Guardian of the Frontline. He can be used to fortify. He only has the melee abilities there with a, with a shield and maybe some kind of hand axe or something like that. But look, he's got two evade abilities, both sabotage and destruction. Okay, sabotage, evade is discard this card to evade an attack. Sabotage. Or destroy this card to evade an attack destruction. So on a sabotage attack, he's going to get in the way and stop the guy. Okay. But he's going to survive the encounter. But if somebody's trying to destroy one of your units or one of your cards, I suppose, you can destroy this card to evade an attack. Because he's a guardian of the front line. And we know that the front line is going to take some hits. So he's going to stop somebody from getting destroyed by putting himself in the way. And he'll be destroyed in the process. So here you have some flexibility. you got to lose the card to do this. Otherwise he can do this um, and, and stay intact. Okay, so that's going to make him pretty valuable. Now his base here is only one in terms of cost. right? But he has these two evade abilities and a higher defense. So you'd say one, maybe two, three. And then the spread between cost and defense might give him another one. And that puts him at four. You see, and that's pricing, that's giving him a VP of uh, 1 because he's below that 7. Okay, so just an idea of how we're coming up with these numbers. Um, and now the defensive field right. Um, it's a magic unit. Um, when I say field right, I mean one who creates fields. In this case, a force field, let's say, that would protect other units. Okay, so again, 7 cunning. And you see the 2 VP to match that. Um, so yeah, he's going to provide two cunning, uh, and no combat, because it's a magic unit, um, and so his, his cunning, he's going to be kind of more mental attributes. Um, his defense is eight, because, again, he's putting up force fields. Ability, you may place this card into the battlefield to grant plus two defense to all of your faction's captains. When one of your captains is captured, destroy this card and end the effect. So the battlefield is what we're calling the area where captains are going to go when they are uh, revealed from the deck. So a captain comes out, he goes into the battlefield and becomes a permanent card that stays on the field. You can put this card into that area, which is very unusual. Typically only captains would go in that area. But you could put this card out there and he's going to put up a force field that's going to add plus two defense to all your faction's captains. Which is huge because, you know, we saw a captain before who was at 13, you know, 11. These are the kind of defense numbers the captains have. Bumping them up by two when it's already hard to kind of stretch and reach those numbers is going to protect your captains a little bit deeper into the game until your opponent can, you know, create enough uh, combat to, to overtake them. Okay, and now he also has evade attrition, which is the third kind of attack. So he has sabotage, destruction, and attrition. You may reveal this card from your hand to evade and attack attrition. Okay, so you can evade an attrition attack, and attrition attacks are going to add those attrition cards that we saw into your deck. Okay, so if you saw the, the video where we were talking about attrition cards, they're pretty much dead cards that come into your hand. They don't contribute anything. In addition, they make you discard 
another card of cost one or more. <coughs> Which means it's going to be a card that you purchased, not a card that you started the game with. He's going to let you evade getting that attrition card into your hand. Okay? And so, um, you see a base of two, and then maybe we have, uh, you know, three and four, five for the spread, and then, you know, this is pretty huge, so... You know, we gave him a little bit more. I mean, in addition, he can fortify. You know, however you want to think about this, just kind of getting a, an idea of how to cost these things. But this is a pretty powerful card because it has this defense ability. In addition, it becomes a permanent. Okay, so anything that's going to have its effect on an ongoing basis is worth a little bit more than something that's going to just have like a one-time effect. Okay. And now we have the offensive field right. The offensive field right costs a little bit less to bring into your hand. And it has combat rather than cunning. So it's the opposite. See? Similar but opposite. It has uh, uh, six defense, which matches its cost. This one was defensive in nature, so it had a higher defense. This one is offensive in nature, so it's equal. Which is actually a little bit under for a dwarf, because we said dwarves would typically have a higher defense than cost. So he's actually a little bit under par in that sense. Um... Well, considering in golf it's good to be under par, I guess he's over par. Let's say he's over par. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, and this again is a magic dwarf. And he has an attack because he's offensive. He has an evade because he's defensive. He has an attack because he's offensive. And his attack is a sabotage attack. You may place this card into an opponent's play area to reduce the calm and cunning of all their cards by one during their next turn. At the end of their turn, place this card into your discard pile. So he's going to actually go into an opponent's play area and kind of nerf all their cards for one turn. So, again, the idea of a field right, putting up a field, this is a, this is a, this is a, like a debuffing shield, a uh, debuffing field, you know what I mean? So it's an offensive field that he's putting up, and it's having this overall effect. Just like over here, it's having an overall effect because it's a field, right? Um, and I like the image for this, a magic dwarf casting an area effect on the enemy from stealth, above, behind them on a rocky hill. So it's like, you know, he's going into their play area, he's going into their space, but he's kind of like hiding and just casting this field out onto them, and they're all like, oh, I feel weak and hungry and I don't know why, you know, that kind of thing. So, <laughs> so the offensive and defensive field rights. Um, and now you see he has the evade as well as this ability, and so his cost is one higher. He only has the attack, so his cost is a little bit lower. I don't know, since they're kind of like opposites of each other in a sense, I might want to even this out somehow, but I'll have to think about that as we go forward. You know, now when, at some point maybe we'll talk about prototyping. Um, you know, I'll typically do this on paper, you know, make, make cards out of paper, and then I'll just kind of scribble and fix stuff as I'm playing the game, you know, so if I think of something for him as I'm playing, or I want to change something, I'll be able to scribble that out, and then I'll come back here and I'll change it, you know, for the next round of prototyping, you know, so we'll see if we can do something to make these guys even, but right now this is, uh, this is the logic behind where they stand. Okay, we don't have any captains yet for the dwarves, that's all we have for the dwarves at this moment. Okay, so not much. But you see that the dwarves here, um, from Osiah Lux, they represent magic, they represent defense. Okay, so you're seeing kind of how, um, you know, um, detonation and explosives. I have another card that I, I made a note of elsewhere that I haven't brought in yet. That's going to have an assault ability that's going to allow him to destroy uh, fortifying units. So another kind of uh, detonation sort of situation where he's going to, um, you know, set a bomb before you actually move in with your assault. He's going to blow up, you know, and, and kill, you know, one or two of the uh, fortifying units before they move in. So you start to get a sense of the dwarves and what they can do. Um, and now let's move into the uh, Starborn Elves, okay? And here we have the notes for the Starborn Elves. Uh, recover units from discard pile, card draw magic boosts, mainly uh, many magic and range proficiencies. Unit defense is often less than cost. So they're not particularly defensive, but they have a lot of magic. Okay. Um, let's see. Equipment. Arbutus of Unruin. Okay. Arbutus is uh, like a, a plant. All right. So um, cost is five cunning. It doesn't offer you anything in combat or, uh, or cunning. Um, the defense is equal to its cost, which is standard fare. That just means that it's like even. It's a plant. You can you can take it just as easily as you could destroy it. 
Destroy this card to place one unit from the destroyed pile into the active field. Alright, so here we mentioned um, recover units from the discard pile, but basically this idea of recovery. And so here we have recovery, you know, elves, healing, that kind of thing. We're actually bringing somebody back to life, unruin. So this ruined um, unit is going to be revived and put into the active field. Okay, so um, maybe you purchased them earlier and he got destroyed. Maybe he got destroyed while in the active field by the opponent. And now he's going to be brought back and put into play and you can recruit him again. Okay, so uh, one VP for the five cost card. Standard fare. Um, and again, this is an equipment item. It's not an attachment. So you just play this from your hand. It doesn't have to be attached to a unit. Uh, Charm of Kinship. Six cunning to buy the card. It offers three cunning. So this is a card that you're probably going to be playing for its cunning, primarily. Defense is equal to cost. Once again, it's a charm. You can smash it. You can take it. Um, oh, this is required magic. So at some point, I guess I was thinking that it would require the magic proficiency. Someone would have to use the charm. Um, okay. Uh, that makes sense. I guess someone would have to use the charm. I guess the charm doesn't just float out in midair and do its own thing. Um... So we could do that. You may play one unit you capture this phase. At the end of your action phase, place it in your captured pile. Okay, so the action phase is when you play your cards, your typical deck building phase. Um, and here this is going to allow you to play a unit that you capture. So this is pretty cool because typically, you know, when you're going to spend resources, you're deciding whether to spend those resources on your own cards or use it to destroy your enemy's cards. Now, in playing this, um, I've realized that you got to be careful about that because, you know, you'll look at your opponent's lineup and you'll be like, oh, I don't want them to have that. I don't want them to have that. And turn by turn by turn will go by where you're um, taking cards away from your opponent and not building your deck. And the next thing you know, you're getting, you know, blindsided by the opponent as they're putting out, you know, all these powerful cards and you're still working with your starter deck. Um, so you have to be careful about that. Here, you can... Uh, make an expenditure by capturing a unit, but then you get to play that unit, which may allow you to actually do something, as opposed to just um, denying your opponent of something. You'll be able to to do something with the card. And it's the charm of kinship. So you're going to use this charm to turn an enemy into an ally temporarily, and then you're going to place them in your captured pile. Okay, and then that's one VP. So if we're going to say this is an attachment, and again, we'll see how this whole attachment thing works out when the time comes, because... Um, you know, um, if we're having trouble lining this up, like, you know, I don't know if you've played Thunderstone where they have the, uh, you know, like the strength of a character and then like the weight of a piece of equipment. Sometimes that could be awkward to line up, you know, and I didn't want it to, to feel too awkward. I wanted to make thematic sense. I wanted to give, uh, you know, a little bit of complexity, um, uh, another note of strategy in the sense that, um, you know, let me focus on this type of equipment and this type of uh, unit proficiency. You know, and, and I can design the, that equipment and the units that have the related proficiency to create a certain um, mechanical theme, you see. So by matching up these two things, your deck would play a certain way. And that's a little bit um, tricky to do, and right now we're kind of just throwing all our ideas into this file and seeing what happens. But as we go along, we can refine it and refine these abilities so that we, we do kind of tell a story with how these things line up. Um, okay, so we move that into the magic attachment section. And here we have vertigo darts, which this see, isn't in the right place either. This should be a ranged... Um, a ranged piece of equipment. Okay. So it's a weapon attachment. Its cost is three cunning. It provides uh, one combat because you're firing a projectile. Um, it's three defense once again, as all the equipment will be because you can take it or smash it. It requires the ranged proficiency. It's a ranged weapon. And units cost two less to capture this turn. Vertigo dots. So you shoot this thing at a unit and it makes it, you know, like disoriented and dizzy. And it makes it easier for you to capture them. Okay. Very good. So now, the tactics. Um, these are the Elvish tactics. Concealed approach. So this idea of stealth. And this number here is <coughs> um, how many of these cards will be in the pool. Okay. And that's really something 
that I usually focus on much later in the process. Um, because you see here, um, you know, the Starborn Elves are to have 50 cards in total. Well, that's not 50 individual cards that we create. That's 50 in total, which means you might have two or three copies of a certain card. So this is, this is going to say, all right, we're going to have multiple copies of this card. I put two now. We'll see how it goes. Okay, so concealed approach. They're going to have a stealthy uh, approach on their enemy. Cost is four. Defense is five. It's a little bit hard to stop the elves from using their tactics. Um, they're very crafty. Uh, concealed approach is going to give you one combat and one cunning because being in stealth does give you some type of an advantage, right? When you launch an assault against a fortified location this turn, you may destroy this card to resol resolve the assault immediately without placing a marching token. Alright, so now we're going to be uh, talking to the veterans of this series who watched the <laughs> setup video. Alright, when we were talking about assaults and how assaults don't just happen immediately. You have to march on the location and it takes two turns to do so. Um, I still haven't figured out how, how that two turns is going to work. Is it two of your turns or is it two of the faction's turns in a team game? Because if, if you're playing one-on-one, -on -one, the faction and is just you. You see, but if in a team game it's two players, so would you flip that token on each faction turn, or would you flip that token only on your turn? I'm thinking of having assaults be individual to the player. It's kind of like each player is going to have their own faction leader, so it's kind of like we're two different parts of the army. So what I'm doing and what you're doing are kind of two different things. Of course, we're working towards the same end, but we're not like walking alongside each other, you know, into war. You know, we might be in different locations, we might be in different areas. So I'm thinking of having um, the assaults be individualized to the player. So if I'm making an assault, then it'll be on my turn that the marching token gets flipped. But you see how that's going to extend it out, because it's two of my turns, which means I'm going to make an assault one turn, then my opponent, two opponents are going to go, my ally is going to go, then I'm going to get to go again. So that's three turns are going to pass before I get to go again, flip that token to the one side. Then three turns are going to pass and then I'm going to make my assault. So, you know, there's a lot of time between that and then we also have to decide who's going to defend in a team game. I'm launching the assault, but who's going to defend? Which player? You see? So that has to be worked out. I'm not sure how I'm going to make that work yet. Um, but what this allows you to do is if you're making an assault against a fortified location, uh, you can destroy this card to resolve, resolve that assault immediately, which means the enemy does not see you coming. There's no marching token. You marched, but they never saw it. And if they never saw it, to them, basically, the assault resolves immediately. You just show up out of nowhere. They had no time to prepare. The whole point with the marching token is to give the enemy time to prepare. Now, there is something I didn't mention, which is that this marching token is only placed when you make an assault against a fortified location. Which means if, if the enemy has a location that's not fortified, you can resolve your assault immediately because there's nobody there to spot you. There's nobody, um, you know, seeing you coming because they didn't fortify it. So there's another reason why fortification becomes important. You don't want to put cards uh, out to fortify because you basically lose them. When they're fortifying, you can't use them until the assault resolves. If an assault resolves, someone may never even come and there's your guy sitting there, you know... Uh, you know, I don't know, you know, you ever seen like, uh, in a lot of comic book movies, you see like, uh, the security guard sitting there with his feet up watching TV, you know, so it's like, you know, an assault may never come, but if it's not fortified, they definitely can't see it, so that's why this only comes into play against a fortified location where you would be normally placing a marching token, now you don't have to, boom, you spring right on the enemy via concealed approach, um, okay, so... Then here we see 10 elves cleverly camouflaged in the brush around a structure or camp. A uh, hidden picture, hard to find. I thought this was a pretty cool idea. You know those hidden pictures where, you know, you look at a picture of a forest and then you have to find the 10 things. Oh, look, there's a shovel in the, in the trunk of the tree. And, oh, there's a bird in the, in the leaves. I didn't see it at first. You have to kind of look and find it. You know, this is like, you know, from the old highlights books when you were a kid uh, all the way until they have ones that are like for adults that are very, very difficult. I thought it would be cool to have this picture of a camp or, or, or a keep or a location that you're, you know, you're going to be assaulting and to have these elves um, as like a hidden picture in that image so that you look at it and you're like, oh, a picture of a location. Oh, wait, no, look, there's an elf in the bushes and oh my God, look, there's an elf like cleverly standing, you know, at the edge of a building or whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I thought that would be a pretty cool idea. 
um, for concealed approach. Oh, and now shot in the dark. So five cunning card. It offers one combat because it's a shot. All right, you're taking a shot with an arrow, let's say. Um, defense is six because it's a shot in the dark. So maybe um, you know. And again, the elf tactics are a little bit. I think I made all the tactics this way, where it's a little bit harder to stop someone from using their tactics. I mean, this is their tactics. This is their MO. You know what I mean? So it's a little bit hard to stop them from doing what they want to do. Reveal the top card of an opponent's deck. If it's a unit, destroy it. Otherwise, place it in its owner's hand. Show yourself. Right? So you're going to reveal the top card of the deck. If it's a unit, you're going to clip it. Otherwise, you're going to put it in its owner's hand. Okay? So now, a shot in the dark. Right? A shot in the dark. So you're just taking a chance. And the chance here is that you're either going to destroy a unit or you're going to give your opponent a card. Because if you take a shot, right, you're, you're revealing yourself, right? There, there's a risk associated with that. You're either going to hit something or the enemy is going to gain some advantage. Now he knows where you are, let's say, or however you want to think about it. But there's a risk associated with a shot in the dark. So this is the risk, is that it's either going to be a unit and you're going to kill it or it's going to go into its owner's hand. Now, of course... You know, you'll want to com- uh, combo this with cards that allow you to look at the top card of your opponent's deck. And now we've been using the word deck a lot, and I hope that it hasn't been too hard to follow, that there's the faction deck, and then there's the individual player deck. The player deck is where you're adding cards to it, reshuffling it, your typical deck building situation. The faction deck is, is the pool of cards that you're choosing from when you buy, right? So when we say look at an opponent's deck, we're looking at the player's deck. An opponent means a player. Otherwise, it would say, uh, you know, opponent's faction or something like that. Um, Opponent's faction deck. So this is looking at their personal deck to do this. Now, we had cards that let you look at the faction deck, but we haven't seen cards that let you look at an opponent's deck, I don't believe. But they will be, and that'll help you uh, with the shot in the dark. And I'm assuming the elves would have cards that would allow you to do that, because that would make sense if you're playing them. Um... Interestingly enough, if you're playing the team game, if I choose the dwarves and you choose the elves, we're going to mash all those cards together for a faction deck. And we're going to be able to recruit any and all. Um, So you will have some interplay between the faction groups as well, which needs to be considered. So there's a lot of, you know, things in the network here that need to be matched up. We have to kind of weave a cohesive web out of all of this. Right now, again, we're just kind of throwing everything out here and and laying it down, and then we'll sort all of that out in playtesting. All right. Um, yeah, so for the elves, we have nothing here in terms of the basic units, um, uh, their faction deck, or their captains. And these are just some uh, expansion ideas, because I thought that, you know, the story of the orc tide is that they, uh, the orcs come into Canton Fields and attack the men, el- elves, and dwarves of that region. But then, as I earlier mentioned, the mages of the northern academies um, in the eastern land of Dawn do lend their support. So, I thought the expansion would have those faction groups. Um, the mages of the Northern Academies send their reinforcements. And then the Ferran, or dwarf druids. Okay, shapeshifters. So, uh, they would also come as part of the reinforcement. And then you'd have the Powderwood Resistance. I really like Powderwood as a location. I like the idea of these elves who are not elvish, in a sense. They're more like men. Um, but of course, there's a little bit more complexity to it than that because they, you know, they have their history. Um, they have their, their tenuous, you know, relationship with the Starborn Elves. Um, and it just seemed like an interesting faction and it seemed like an interesting place. I mean, these elf blacksmiths, you know, hammering away at, at steel and, you know, salvaging. You know, uh, they, they don't have the wealth that you sometimes uh, see, you know, kind of associated with elves. In that way, uh, you know, they're always like lavishly adorned and whatnot. Not always, you know, but uh, that's their main stereotype. And so these are kind of like down and dirty elves, and I kind of like that about them. So I thought I'd bring in the Powderwood Resistance. So this is what they're contributing, because we didn't really talk much about them. We have the Starborn Elves, um, you know, and, and we have the men of the region, but we don't have what Powderwood was doing, other than that one hunter who you could recruit, maybe bringing in an entire faction group as part of an expansion. So we'll see about that. And now we're into the unified uh, orc clan. So let's go to them next time, because here we are at 40 minutes once again. That goes by so fast. But, um, you know, again, I'm happy that we got a chance to look at, look at some of this stuff. And now that we're done with all those guys, we're going to get into the orcs who have, you know, a whole different thing going on. So uh, we'll do that next time. Thanks for checking in. I'll see you then.